Who's going to say amen to that? I, you know, I, it's dangerous for me to show that before I preach because it often puts me on such a wreck afterwards. This morning, I, I go to Denny's before church early and I mark up my manuscript. It's like going to the range before you play golf. And, and, I, and I ended up showing several wait staff and a manager this thing. I opened it up like, you got to see this. I'm showing this in church. And at one point, I'm like heaving and weeping and the manager's looking out of her eye like, are you okay? And what I love is how I find myself identifying with the joy that we see in those folks. It is the absolutely perfect and appropriate response to have overwhelming joy at the news of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. Many of you resonate. Anybody resonate with that? Amen to that. What a joy. Now, I'll tell you, there was a time that I didn't know what that was about. And even went to church sometimes when my folks wanted me to go. And I'd sit in Easter and I, I really didn't get what's the, with the bunnies and why do bunnies lay eggs? I mean, what's wrong with that genetically? And the whole thing is just sort of odd and weird. And I didn't get it at all. And I certainly didn't have that joy. And if that's where you're at at all today, maybe you're here celebrating or maybe you're here because somebody brought you or you've been finding yourself at church because there's something here you're looking for. And if that's, if you're on that journey, I want to say this is a very safe place to discover what I hope to show you today. And that's this, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the greatest joy we can know in this life by far. Absolutely. The resurrection of Jesus is the single event that will more change world history than anything else by far. And so I'm grateful to talk about this today. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to just remember, um, uh, I invited you to talk to somebody about baptism. You're going to have to like stand up and go talk to those folks if you want. So if you're like, I'm in, make sure you follow through on that today. But let me tell you why this is so significant, what Jesus did for us. First of all, he came to a world that is, is a dying world. I mean, there's so much that's good in the world in which we're living, but there's also so much that isn't. Every one of us in this room is experiencing. We see this in Luke chapter 24, verse, verse 1. We get caught up into the story of several dear women who are a wreck. They're a wreck. Chapter 24, verse 1, on the first day of the week, which is now Sunday, very early in the morning, the women took spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. These women are on a mission, so they're up at the crack of dawn. Why? Because the last 56 hours have been horrific. Their souls have been torn. They're, first, they're in Jerusalem because they'd followed Jesus. They'd come down from Galilee. They'd They'd, they, they'd given their hearts to him, their lives to him, because they'd seen him feed the hungry, masses of the hungry. They'd seen him speak words and heal the leprous and the lame and the blind. They'd seen him go to funerals and speak a word of resurrection. Every funeral he went to, the dead guy rose again, right? And as a pastor, I'm like, well, there's a pastor that didn't get to share his funeral sermon because they were like born, they like rose up. Death and Jesus never have gotten along very well. And so these people had seen all that, and mostly they'd heard him tell them things about God, about God the Father. They realized he was real, and he was present, and he was good, and the worship of him brought life. I mean, they gave him themselves, and they're in Jerusalem. And not only that, things had been going well. A week before, they were there when 100,000 people at least poured out of the gates of Jerusalem and met Jesus on the two-mile road from Bethany up to Jerusalem and declared, Hosanna, blessed is he who's coming in the name of the Lord. I mean, I mean, things were crescendoing. They were overwhelmed, these women. But then that next Thursday night, the night before, something went terribly wrong. After the, the Passover, Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane and he was arrested. Jesus was arrested this beloved one. And he was taken to the Jewish leadership. And before the Jewish leadership, he was condemned to death for blasphemy. Where did that come from? They're saying death. They want, his, they want him dead. And they would have perhaps seen this Jesus handed over to the Roman authorities. And even though Pilate, the Roman governor, three times tried to release Jesus, their own countrymen threatened riot and their countrymen cried crucified. They wanted Jesus crucified. You, there, there is no more horrible physical way to die, and that's what they wanted for him. And when Pilate tried to release, the crowd started to be riotous, and so he succumbed and handed Jesus over to be executed. And then these dear women may have seen Jesus, their beloved Jesus, beaten by Roman soldiers. 
and mocked and humiliated and stripped and had a crown of thorns pressed down onto his head. They would have um, seen him scourged by a Roman whip, which is enough to kill a man, and then forced to carry his cross as much as he could up to Golgotha, this hill. And it was laid down, and perhaps they saw his arms stretched out and heard these spikes as they were nailed into both of his wrists and into his feet and saw him hoisted up and placed in a stand and left to die for hours by slow suffocation. That's what they'd seen. No wonder their souls were torn. And eventually he died. Six hours later, he died. And dear friends, took him down from the cross and they hurriedly wrapped him as best they could and put him into a borrowed grave and sealed it. And then the sun was down and it was Sabbath. And so because of the Jewish Sabbath, the women couldn't leave their homes to go visit. Oh, that's Saturday. Just imagine what that was like, the grieving and the questions and the what, what happened and how did we get here and all of that that went on that Saturday. And so Sunday morning, first thing, there's just a speck of light in the, on the eastern horizon, and they're off. They've been up for hours, and they take spices. And why do they take spices? They want to go into the tomb, and they want to place spices in the grave clothes of Jesus because they want to save him the indignity of the smell of decay because they love him. It's a, it's a mission of love. They want to be near him. Now, I take all of that time to unpack verse 1 because the good news of the resurrection is particularly good news because it's into a world where people feel lost like this, that Jesus came, to deal with the cause of that loss, to destroy it, to overcome it. That's why he came. And the truth is that brokenness isn't something we see these women only. Every one of us in this room has had our souls torn. Maybe that's where you are today and lost people that we love and had uncertainty. And I'm not saying all of life is bad. There's so much that's so good. But we all, let's just take them one at a time. We we will experience death. We have experienced death in people that we know. Several weeks ago, a very, very dear friend of mine laid her sister to rest and the grief of that's been overwhelming. Friday night in our Good Friday service, we got home and another really good friend of ours, mom, passed away while we were in our service. We got, we got a text and a call was made. I leave Tuesday morning with my family to officiate at the memorial service for my sister's husband who died after 13 years of trying to endure the effect of a terrible stroke. I mean, his, gosh, Gary, these have been hard years, and I'm so grateful. Every other week for several years of that, he and I met and we read the Bible and prayed together. I'm grateful for where he is today, but talk about overwhelming. We experience, what's our answer for death? What's your answer for your coming death? Because it's coming. Maybe today. You don't know. Another thing, relationships in our world have been broken. I mean, in these last days, I've met with couples whose marriages are in terrible trouble. I've prayed with parents, more than one, who see their kids on what seems like a suicidal trajectory to destruction in their life, and they're feeling overwhelmed. This last week, I was with one of my closest friends who was walking through one of the most painful times in his entire life. Everywhere we look, we see relationships that are broken. People carry wounds. We do a small group at Lakeland called Vantage Point 3, VP3. And one of the things we do in it is to actually literally write out our entire story, our life story, and how maybe God had been at work in that whole time. But the one I'm in right now, there are nine of us, and we just finished. Every one of us takes more than an hour to read your life story. And every one of us have had pain and tearing to our soul. We experience loneliness for relationships that haven't happened. We experience contempt at the other other people's bias. What's our answer for, what's your answer for that? For the brokenness of relationships here. And not only that, our relationships with ourselves are broken. One theologian years ago wrote this, the more abundant the benefits civilization, of a civilization that comes streaming our way, the emptier our lives become with all its wealth and power. It only shows that the human heart in which God has put eternity, and that's a reference to Ecclesiastes where Solomon says that God has, when he made you, he set eternity in your heart. Your heart has the capacity for eternity. Eternity, which is why so large is 
your human heart that all of the world is too small to satisfy. If God isn't in there in a very living and alive way, there's an emptiness. What's your antidote to that? And all of the, I'm looking for something and I don't know what it is, desperateness of living that is, our relationship with ourself is a mess and we feel shame for being inadequate. We carry that all the time. We feel guilt for things that we've done. We feel uncertainty. We have a hard time trusting. Our relationship with ourself has been wrecked in the world in which we're living. And to just say it, our relationship with God has been broken as well. That way back when, I didn't understand that. I didn't know what I was missing in not knowing God, right? This, that, that's the emptiness that I was made to worship him. And when I'm worshiping him, I'm alive. But if I don't know him, this vacuous hole, I just keep shoving things into. And if, you, if you're a reader of the Bible, even if you just read the beginning, you know the cause of all of this is found in the first three chapters of the Bible. When God made the first of us, I mean, where did we come from if not from God? Why is there something rather than nothing? Because there's a God. And he made us in his image. He made us like him so we could know him and worship him. And he asked of our first parents, Adam and Eve, the one thing that is true of all relationships, that they trust him. That they trust him as God in their lives. They tr that's, that's a relationship. It's true with us. How much more with him? But Adam and Eve, deceived by the evil one, actually thought they could have a better life. Boy, that's what temptation does to you. Thought they could have a better life if they were in charge of their own life, masters of their own fate, free of all of these restrictions and commands. And so they sinned. And they did what happens in a marriage when one has an affair with someone else to this. They broke this relationship. We were separated from God. That's what we find in the Scriptures the source of life we stepped away from. And as a result of that, we find ourselves in the world in which we are. We said we want a world without you in it, and God said, fine, and that's how we ended up where we are. That's the circumstance of verse 1. But as these women who are wrecked by the world the way we have been wrecked by the world arrive at the tomb, something has happened. Verse 2, they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, and when they entered did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Bodies don't get up and walk away by themselves, right? Well, verse 4, while they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning, it hurt to look at them, they were angels, stood beside them. And in their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, and then they shared the best news that could ever be heard. The men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, say these words, but has risen. Let's just read that. He is not here, but has risen. Whoa. Now, before they even have a chance to metabolize what he just said, right? I mean, that's, what did you just say? What's that even mean? Has it really happened? Before they have a chance to really have registered the promise that just made, the angels go on and what they share is that Jesus died for us. It wasn't an accident. It was on purpose. His dying was for our saving. That's what we learn. And so they go on to say, remember how he told us while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinners be crucified and on the third day rise again. Now, just two words, question, two words that are here. Why did, it, why did the angels not say he had to be handed to men? Why did he say to sinners? And why did he say he must be delivered to sinners? And the answer is because the only way sinners can be forgiven of their sins is if he was handed to them to die and rise. That something about his death and rising is the antidote for these things with which we struggle so much. The truth is, it wasn't just a few people that crucified Jesus. It was all of us. He died on the cross for the sins we have all committed. Our sins were there. We saw it just a few weeks ago as we were here. And I'm not saying that you were one of the people that put a nail to his wrist, but I am saying that even though at times we can act with love and kindness and mercy and humility, None of us is capable of not, of living completely free of jealousy some days and vanity and rage and slander 
and gossip and lust and dishonesty and cruelty and judgmentalism and pride, those things also are inside of our heart. What do you call somebody who murders someone else? What do you call them? A murderer. What do you call someone who robs or thieves other people? You call them a? What do you call someone who sins? A? We're sinners. And this is a problem for us. And the reason it's a problem for us is that God, who is good and loving, therefore necessarily hates evil. He hates it. (coughs) Excuse me. In 1994, when the ruling Hutus in Rwanda murdered 800,000 Tutsis, in 100 of those days, 100,000 people were hacked to death with machetes. How do you think God felt about that? Was he indifferent? Did he not care? Or in 1915 and 1916, when uh, the Muslim uh, world slaughtered 1.2 million Christians in what is modern-day Turkey and the Ottoman invasion of that place. How do you think God felt about that? It is said the rivers were literally red with blood. How do you th- in, our, in a room this size, odds are dozens of us have been sexually abused when we were little. How do you think God feels about that? If he's indifferent to evil, he's not good. He's immoral if he's ambivalent. And he's not. He hates it. He hates evil. And while I've not slaughtered someone, something of the spirit of the sins that I've just described is in me and it's in you. And our future one day is to stand before him. What's our answer to that? And the answer to that is what God did in Jesus Christ. How do you get something clean, right? There's darkness in us. There's, how, do I, how, how do you get anything clean? You get one thing clean by something else becoming dirty, right? That's how that happens. This is God's answer. For us to be clean, Christ on the cross became dirty. He took our sins as if they're his. My youngest son, Josh, um, when he became of age, we helped him get a car. We got a car for him when he could drive. But he wasn't he was still a minor, so we put the car in my name. The title for his car, the car he drives, is my name. It's my car. So when Josh was driving out to California, <laughs> he apparently went through an automated radar trap set up by the police. And you know what that meant? That meant he got a ticket. Did the ticket go to his house? No, it came to my house. Guess who's responsible for the speeding of that car before the government? I am. I can't say, I wasn't in the car, I'm sorry. I had to pay the ticket. Now, he and I did have words, but for his, <laughs> for his action, I was legally responsible. This is precisely what happened on the cross. Paul says this very thing in 2 Corinthians 5. God made him who had no sin, because Jesus, he's the only one who could do this for us. He was holy. He had never sinned. He didn't die for his sins. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us on the cross. When you think of Jesus on the cross, he's not just dying a terrible death at the hands of people. The horror especially is that he's dying as the sin bearer before God for our sins, my sins, the sins of his people, so that we might become the righteousness of God. This is what Easter, the Good Friday and Easter tell us God has done. This is his answer to these enemies in our lives. And before I even unpack that a little more, can I just ask, what's this tell you about him? What's it tell you about the heart of Jesus Christ and his father who would send him? Tim Keller years ago said this, there is no way to have a real relationship without becoming vulnerable to hurt. If I'm going to keep myself from getting hurt by you, I don't have a relationship with you. Well, guess what? Easter tells us that God became breakable. God became vulnerable. He became fragile. God became someone we could hurt so that he could get us back. Jesus died in our place. Now, if that was it, if he had died, we would commemorate him as a great hero. That it would have been overwhelming. But that's not the end of the story. That's what Easter morning is about because Jesus was also then raised from the dead. Having died the death, he did. We come to verse 36. The disciples are back in the upper room and the door's locked because the same people that crucified Jesus are still out there. 
perhaps looking for them, they're terrified. And what is it that happens to them as they're there? Suddenly there's a pound, 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 pound at the door and they open it. And these couple guys <coughs> who say, we were on the road to Emmaus. Those are the folks who are going to get baptized. That's where they're going. Um, they, they, uh, they were, we were on the road to Emmaus and all of a sudden we were with this person and we realized it was Jesus. He was actually, we were with him. He told us how the entire Old Testament had said he must suffer and die and rise again. And our hearts burned as we heard him say this. It was overwhelming. And then he just sort of vanished. And we're here to tell you Jesus has been raised. And so the disciples are like, they're hearing this story. And then we come to verse 36. As they were talking about these things, those guys who had just come, Jesus himself stood among them. And he said, peace be with you. I've always loved that. I, I just think it's funny if he'd showed up and said, boo, right? I mean, he, <laughs> everyone would have died instantly. <laughs> so he's gentle with us. And here he is alive. Jesus is alive. He'd been crucified, buried in the grave in an airless tomb for three days, and now he's alive. Oh, my goodness. Verse 37, they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a ghost. <laughs> yeah, I bet. I mean, he'd said he was going to rise again, but they weren't maybe sure it was literal. They didn't expect him to die, first of all. And is this going to happen right now? There you are. I can't believe you're right there. He's there. And before I go further, just realize, given what we've said, what this means. This means that our sin problem has been dealt with. If he died to bear my sins and now he's back, my sin problem has been solved. A criminal doesn't get out of jail until he's paid his debt in full. But when he's paid his debt in full and gets out of jail, the law has no claim on him any longer. That Jesus, the sin bearer, is standing here says that when he said it is finished, it meant every one of these sins, the darkness in my heart, if you've confessed and repented and believed, all of them, past, present, and future, have been paid for. The Father sees you today through the blood of the Lord Jesus as clean, as forgiven. And then what separates you from God has been removed. And somehow, he today through Christ reaches out to you and he welcomes you with the same love with which he welcomes his son, Jesus Christ, because you are a son or a daughter. That's what he makes you. And this hole in your heart, suddenly he's in it. He's there. That's his answer for our sin for our separation from him, our death problem has been dealt with. I mean, the one who died was no longer dead. So what death did to Jesus was nothing compared to what Jesus did to death. Death could never take hold of him again. He would never die again. Alive forevermore, eternal life. And when we come to Christ, we receive eternal life. Yeah, I know our bodies die, but guess what? There's a part of you that even in death doesn't die. John says, you will never see death. You are eternally alive. My last breath here is followed by my first breath actually with Jesus. So Gary Street, my brother-in-law, who a couple weeks ago went to be with the Lord, he's more alive today than he has ever been. And that's not a wish dream or a fable. Historically, if Jesus rose from the dead, everything has changed. Our death has been turned... I'm not making light of the pain of it in this life but the greatest tragedy is not dying. The greatest tragedy is dying without Christ. Dying, Christ turned death into an Uber driver <laughs> <laughs> who carries me into the presence of my Lord that fast. It's an enemy, he's a trespasser, but he's been defeated. All of that is in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Praise be to God. And so he says, they said to him, why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And when they had said this, he showed them his hands and feet and he was risen again. And the reason he did this was because we now could receive life from him. Eternal life but even his life in us, a kind of life. He moves on in chapter 24 to verse 45. Then Luke does. Then he opened their minds that they could understand the scriptures and they got 
God in a way they never had before, not from a distance, but as one who, while holy and infinite and ruling, is also Abba and Father and intimate and gentle and welcoming and close and present. And not from a foreign land at a foreign time, but right now, right here with us, reaching out to you. He is reaching out to you right now because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Knocking at the door saying, I want in. I'll have mercy. Open your heart to me. Get this. Jesus didn't die just to forgive us of our sins, so we keep living our life here like we've been living it. Jesus died to forgive us of our sins so that we'd be restored to worship. Jesus died to forgive us of our sins so we would get a God who would send his son to die to forgive us of our sins and worship him. Do you get what I'm saying? He's removed deadness to him. We're alive, not because he makes us the center of his universe, but because we make him the center of ours. You were designed to give glory and honor to God. And when you're a worshiper of him and a follower of him and a truster of him and a prayer to him, you are experiencing the life that God intended because he is great in you. He died so we could have this life. Whether you know it or not, every human being is in search of a savior. All of us are. If anything is your savior besides him, it's not your savior, it's your master. Right? It rules over you. It's not giving you the life you hoped it would give you, success or money or privilege or the honor of other people or fill in the blank, being in great, better shape than others or cuter than others or whatever. Whatever you're pursuing to give you life, it isn't working, is it? Because it's not a savior. He's your savior. That's what we celebrate at Easter, made possible by Christ. So how do we respond? I'd say there are two responses. The first is this. Maybe you're here today to become a Christian. Maybe that's why you're in this room right now. Because even though you may have been spiritual and religious and so forth, you yourself have never said, sorry, thank you, please, <laughs> right, those words. You've never really been honest about the fact that, and said to him, God, even though you're good, I have never actually trusted you. Every good thing in my life, you gave me. But I, I have, I've wanted your stuff. I haven't wanted you. I've dishonored you. Showing up in a thousand sins because sin is that I'm trusting me more than you. And I'm, I'm sorry. I, I just tell you I'm sorry. Maybe you need to say that. Say it right now if you haven't said it. Second of all, thank you. Thank you that when I was dying in my sin, you came to me. We don't have an answer for the death in this world, but you came into this world to break it, and you did. Thank you for dying on the cross and rising again as my Savior. Please, I come into my life, and you, I receive you as king. Here's, this is a big deal. I'm handing you the steering wheel of my life. You are now in charge of my life. I follow you. If that expresses your heart, guess what? A new thing is happening in you. His Spirit is giving you new life. The other day, I was, on, I was coming home from a friend's house, and I was on Peterson Road going east, and I came to 83, and I went to turn north to come home, but there was a road sign on the side of the road. This is it. Detour road closed to truth through traffic. Now, it wasn't in the middle of 83. It was on the shoulder. And as I looked down 83, it was clear sailing, and there were cars that were traveling down this road. So I thought, surely it's not a closed road. Surely... It's a thr look, there are all these cars that are all, all I see is good. So I guess what I did? I went north. I just assumed the sign was for somebody else in another day. I got a mile and a half down the road, and guess what I discovered? <laughs> the road was closed. I could have busted through that, but you come to, there's no road. There's a big ditch where the railroad track was. It would not have gone well for me. As a Christian, I don't want to offend anybody, but maybe this is offensive for me to say to you. Nevertheless, it's true. I need to say it. If you're looking for a Savior other than Jesus Christ, you're on a dead-end road. It looks like everything's... I, I look forward, everything looks fine. And there are all these other people on the road who are going with me. Surely this isn't a dead-end road. And I'm going to tell you, it is. If Jesus Christ isn't the end of your road, you will ultimately face a God by yourself without him when you die, and you will. 
But the amazing message here, I had to stop and in humility, turn around (laughs) and go the other way. But I could, you can do that. You can say, I'm gonna stop on this path, I'm done. I'm gonna turn around and I'm gonna turn to him and I'm gonna say, God, I can't even get myself home. I, I accept being found by you, you be Lord of my life. Tell him that right now, tell him that right now. And by God's grace, <laughs> you enter the kingdom of God. That's what Easter is for. Don't put it off another day. Why do you keep saying tomorrow, 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 I'll deal with this. Why not today? Why not right now? Say, Lord, I'm yours. Just tell him, Lord, I'm yours. For those of us, and then come talk to me after the service. I would love to hear about what God is doing in your heart. Second of all, for those of us who are Christians already, may we live like a people who believe in the resurrection. That that Jesus has defeated these enemies in our lives. Some of us have our, our souls go, mind you, go up and down with my circumstances, good or bad, just like everybody else. I don't live like somebody who believes. I am indwelt and accompanied by the resurrected Jesus Christ. Well, I am. And so are you if you're a follower of Christ. May we live as those people. Amen to that? May we live as those people. So let's do this. Could we stand together? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close this part of our service in prayer, and then we're going to watch some folks be baptized. I hope your heart is encouraged as we celebrate the great work of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father that while we were dead in our transgressions and sins, which we embraced running from you like a sheep wandering off, thinking we'd be free and therefore happy and discovered we were lost and in danger. Thank you that you came to us. Thank you that you didn't only come in history 2000 years ago, but you're with us right now, reaching out to us and saying to us, I am your savior watching for us to accept being found. You hoist us up. You carry us back. You bear the burden of our salvation. You rose again victorious. We worship you, Lord God and King. 